thanks for that introduction, and thank you for inviting me to this forum to share some of my thoughts with you. Um, so, uh, I'll just press enter, right? It's going to bring up. Where is the map? Where is the map? Okay. High tech stuff here. There we go. So, I'm supposed to talk about the leadership transition. So, March 14th, high day, you know. Uh, high day. Uh, about a month ago, uh, National People's Congress elected uh, Xi Jinping as the president of China with a comfortable margin, 99.86% uh, of the vote. Uh, that includes three abstentions and one vote against. So my theory is that this is the vote against. <laughs> because can you think about how much credibility to the uh, winning vote, it lends to have some votes against, right? So this man knows what he's doing. He's trying to have some votes against to lend credibility to the overwhelming surprise of this vote. Uh, of course, this was uh, uncontested elections. And of course, the real leadership transition happened uh, about five months ago, on November 8th, when the uh, Communist Party Central Committee elected the 25-member Politburo and its subset of uh, seven members of the Politburo Standing Committee. That was also in uncontested elections. So, this new 25-member Politburo, and especially the seven-member Communist Party Politburo Standing Committee, with uh, Xi Jinping as its chief, is the decision-making core in Chinese politics, as you know. And when we talk about the Chinese political elite, or the Chinese leadership, the Chinese leadership transition, we are talking about these leaders. We are talking about the 25, and especially, we are talking about the seven. And of course, these seven are and 25, and indeed the uh, roughly 300 who, who elect them are not popularly elected, and indeed, from uh, 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 everything we know, although it was a practical certainty, I, I, I told my students I could eat my hat, um, I wear a hat, so I'm safe. I said it was a practical certainty since 2007 that Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang would be on the political standing committee and that Xi would be elected as a uh, party leader and then he would be elected as president, just as Li Keqiang would be elected as premier. Uh, more recently. Um, still, that said, the scramble for positions on the Politburo and the Politburo Standing Committee happened quite late. We were, we were all wondering how it would turn out. And indeed, the 18th Party Congress was held quite late, unprecedentedly late. So um, all of this was shrouded in uh, a, a great secrecy. Nonetheless, I want to argue that what we saw with the 18th Party Congress, that what we saw with this leadership transition, was an orderly leadership transition. And it was an orderly leadership transition that reflects the growing institutionalization in Chinese politics. And in particular, it reflects the growing institutionalization in Chinese elite politics. And let me talk a little bit uh, about some of the examples of that. Just run through with you. Okay. Um, first of all, and, and not trivially, uh, you're all too young to 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 remember uh, Mao Zedong declaring that Lin Biao was the you know not just Zui Qinmi de but Zui 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 Qinmi de, and then to understand. Uh, uh, in, in an announcement that Lin Biao had tried to assassinate Mao. So, so, so this is not in your memory, I, I'm pretty sure. But what we had in the 18th Party Congress was a succession problem resolved in an orderly way, which is very difficult for an authoritarian political system. Um, we had an established party leader, Hu Jintao retires in favor of a younger leader, uh, and that younger leader, Xi Jinping, had been prepared for this position for some five years. That's quite astonishing and important and a good thing. Um, we had the age 68 rule observed. That is to say the Politburo members 
who had reached the age of 68, retired. They were not kept on. We have a balance of institutional constituencies on the Politburo. Uh, so, so, so we have a rough balance of party apparatus leaders, government apparatus leaders, and regional leaders on the Politburo. Moreover, we have a very significant limitation of the number of military leaders, three, on the Politburo. And, yeah, very interesting. Um, and so the balance of institutional constituencies prevents any single institutional consistent constituency from dominating decision making. The uh, relative uh, paucity of military leaders should prevent a top party leader from using the military as his base. Um, in addition, Xi Jinping is not referred to as the core leader. He's referred to as the party secretary. Um, and uh, the idea is he is the party secretary of a collective decision-making body. So all of these outcomes that I just talked about, all of these outcomes are consistent with what we have observed in the past two successions in, in Chinese politics. Um, so, they're relatively new. These are post-Mao uh, outcomes. But we have seen a certain regularity in, uh, of this sort in leadership transitions in post-Mao politics to the extent that we can at least cautiously talk about an institutionalization. Uh, the person who has the most power in China, that's the Communist Party leader, you know, Hu Jintao, step down from office. Oh, this is an institution. We recognize an institution when, uh, when it does not always accord with the preferences of those with the most power. So we see these, uh, this, this institutionalization in Chinese politics. And I can talk a little bit more about institutions if, if, if there are questions. Um, the other institution that we also see is that um, the Politburo Standing Committee remains a boys club. Um, the uh, only fourth generation Politburo member uh, who was not promoted to the Standing Committee, Ms. Liu, is a woman. Um, so that hasn't changed. So institutions are neutral. Uh, or or uh, let's, let's, let's just say institutions are not necessarily benign. Um, and the other thing we saw, which is of great interest and too early perhaps to call it an institution, is that Hu uh, Jintao Quan Tui. Now this was very interesting, right? Fully retired. Uh, because uh, Jiang Zemin had not done this, right? Jiang Zemin had retired from party position and yet held on to his central military commission uh, position. And uh, there was a lot of discussion. Uh, and indeed, there was an expectation that that was the institution, that the party leader would step down uh, as party leader, but would not change place. So uh, we've heard a lot of speculation about why that occurred. But if that is a new institution, that's very interesting. And um, I, I think another positive sign for um, Chinese leadership politics. So whether we define the Chinese political elite narrowly as the uh, 25 member Politburo or uh, even more narrowly as the seven member Politburo Standing Committee or whether we define it more broadly as the uh, 376 member, and I may count this, uh, Central Committee what we saw with this leadership transition in November uh, 2012 was a sweeping leadership transition. This was major change, um, and that's what you see here. Turnover was very extensive. 71% of the Politburo Standing Committee, new faces. 60% uh, of the Politburo, new faces. 64% of the Central Committee, new faces. Moreover, these are not just new faces. These are not just new people. These are different sorts 
of people. And so it's a leadership transition, not just in a sense of new people, but new, a, a, new, a new type of, of, of leadership. Let me give you a few, um, a few characteristics uh, that uh, illustrate this. This is a more highly educated uh, Central Committee, more highly educated Politburo, more highly educated uh, Standing Committee, but in particular, a more highly educated Central Committee. Uh, major change there. Uh, not only college graduates, but uh, graduate degrees, so people holding master's degrees, PhDs. Uh, I will say some of these are from uh, party schools, uh, but and not, not the party school like UW Madison. I would correct uh, my first <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's party school, but, um, but, but certainly some, also some very legitimate um, uh, 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 tertiary institutions, graduate degrees. Moreover, um, not just more highly educated, these people are differently educated. Um, we see uh, 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 the emergence of, God forbid, social scientists uh, uh, among the Chinese elites, right? This is the, the, the lawyers, the, the uh, economists, um, political scientists, uh, and, and, and not the technocrats. This is not, uh, this is not the rule of engineers, uh, 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 Xi Jinping notwithstanding, who is of course a chemical engineer, um, uh, for a graduate degree, but um, uh, this is really a change in the type of education that these uh, leaders have. Um, most of them are also a new political generation. So both uh, Xi Jinping and, and, and especially Li Keqiang, um, as well as most of the Central Committee members, are what we call fifth generation. Uh, political leaders. And that we, we define these political generations by the context in which they grew up. Where were their formative experiences? So uh, this is a generation that, um, well, like the fourth generation, they did experience the Cultural Revolution, but most of them were young uh, during the Cultural Revolution. Uh, most of them, uh, uh, and therefore, did not take part in the Red Guard uh, activity. But they did, in the 1970s, most of them go out to work in the countryside or work in a factory, uh, Xi Jinping as well. Uh, and that gave them some understanding of general, of their society. They have some understanding of Chinese society. Uh, moreover, they went to college, most of them, in the post mao era, once the examination system had been restored in 1977, and in particular, that very difficult uh, uh, Dikutang, uh, in 1978, uh, at Beijing, the most in 78, this is the cream of the crop. This was the most difficult time to get into uh, the exam, into into a top university because you had all those cultural revolution students plus the new students taking the exam. And uh, so these are students. These are this is this is a leadership that received a pretty high quality education uh, compared to the education that people had received uh, in colleges if they were in colleges. In, in, in the cultural revolution. Um, so, what does this mean for the Sino-US relationship? Who knows? We don't know. Um, we really do not know the values of these people. Uh, we, we await that. Uh, do we believe that uh, people trained in social science approach problems differently than people trained as engineers. You know, there's some sense that there is a greater uh, 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 appreciation of, of, of a nuance to problems. Uh, certainly these are people who understand the outside world much better than the previous generation. Um, but, but the truth is we really don't know. Um, they're, they're less ideological, but we really don't know how they will approach. Uh, it, it's too early to say. But let me talk about, uh, seeing as previous uh, speakers have focused on the economy, let me talk a little bit about some of the, and, and I will say the economic relationship is, is, is also a political relationship. But let me focus on some of the political or, or geopolitical um, issue areas in the Sino-US relationship and where they are now and where they may be headed. And I will say that I'm pretty optimistic um, about, about this relationship. Um, 
uh, let me say more about me than about uh, uh, Sinai this relationship. Okay. Um, let's start with Taiwan. Well, in the past, this was a major area of friction. I don't know if you've read Susan Shirk's Fragile Superpower, but it starts with a scenario of a possible war, uh, a crisis in the Taiwan Straits. Um, and certainly, when we look at the basis of this relationship, um, you, know, you, you have uh, the US policy of strategic ambiguity, uh, which most people interpret as going to Taiwan's aid. Um, you have a principled and very assertive rejection of any effort on the part of the, as I say, of mainland China, of any, any effort on the part of the, of the Taiwanese uh, to assert its independence, or even suggest independence. Um, so this was the makings of a very, of, of a possible crisis. And, and, and this, when people talked about the Sino-U.S. relationship, they had to talk about Taiwan. This was, this, was a, a, this was a triangle. It was not a dyad. Well, the relationship between China and Taiwan is better now than it has been. And uh, although there are always underlying tensions, the economic relationship is very strong, and the political relationship is moving along too. Um, we fully expect there will be discussions between Xi Jinping and, and, and leaders from Taiwan uh, today or tomorrow on the on the uh, sidelines of regional summits. So this is an area in which I I, I think uh, uh, that relationship is no longer something we need to fear uh, as, as a crisis. Um, so so uh, and, and because of that, that eases the sign of U.S. relationship. as a major uh, easing of the sign of U.S. relationship. We talk about North Korea. Now, this is more, my, my view here may be more controversial. Um, I think that China and the United States have strong common interests on North Korea. Uh, and um, I also think uh, th those common interests are a, a denuclearized Korean peninsula, peninsula, as well as a stable. North Korea, and a North Korea that's engaging in economic reform. Economic reform of the type that we're beginning to see in Cuba, that we're just, you know, seeing in Vietnam, and indeed of the type that China itself undertook in the late 1970s and early 1980s. And I think that China and the U.S. both have an interest in that. Um, I also see that China has taken <coughs> unprecedented steps as a major, responsible, great power uh, on this issue, voting for UN sanctions against North Korea. Not just abstaining, but voting for UN sanctions. And also making efforts to exert what influence it has, and I'm guessing it has a lot less influence than we think it has, uh, especially with the new leadership in North Korea. But an effort to make uh, influence uh, 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 North Korea as best it can um, to stabilize the situation. So I think that the uh, Sino-U.S. relationship and common interests is sound enough and complementary enough to manage the, the unfolding current uh, crisis on the issue of North Korea, which does not mean that it's not a very serious crisis. But as far as sign of U.S. relationship goes, I think there's a commonality there. Uh, in the past, China would often resort to saying, well, you know, we're, we're, we're promoting the five-party talks. But we've gone well beyond that. You know, China is, is, is really stepping up and taking actions to resolve urgent problems on, 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 on the North Korean side. Now, if you thought that was a little controversial, you'll think what I'm going to say right now is highly controversial uh, because I want to talk about the Xiaoyu Dao, or Senhaku Islands. Um, and this is certainly a more difficult uh, problem. At the same time, although it's a more difficult problem, in a way it's a less difficult problem because I don't think this is at all negotiable. 
I don't think this is a problem that, uh, the, that, that the two sides, that is to say China and Japan, and Japan is a U.S. ally, I don't think this is a problem that China and Japan can negotiate. Uh, what we have here is different understandings of a historical basis for territorial claims. And uh, I haven't heard anything, I've heard from both sides that there is a willingness to sit down, and I'll get to that in a moment, but I haven't really heard anything that says these things are negotiable. And that, that makes sense to me. I think, I, I don't see a, a basis here for a negotiation. These are fundamentally different interpretations of, of the uh, historical records. Um, however, uh, it's not in the interest of either side to have hot war on this. It may be in the interest of the nationalist Japanese leader to keep this issue simmering. It may be in the interest of a Chinese leader to keep this issue simmering. But there's no interest in having a hot war on these islands. So, at worst, there's an interest in keeping the issue similar um, until it goes away and it's not resolved or somehow resolved. But I, I don't see, I, this, is, this is a difficult problem. Um, so I, I think the United States has asserted a very clear interest in ensuring that this does not lead to a hot war. And we have seen a few instances of Japanese radar walking on, uh, on Chinese planes. Um, uh, but I, I, I think that staying out of an accidental hot conflict is a major challenge, and I think both of these uh, powers understand that. And when I say both of these powers, I mean China and Japan. We move on to the next one, which is um, hacking, cyber espionage, cyber warfare. Now, um, I don't know how many of you read the recent Mandiant report on uh, hacking, which uh, traced hacking of uh, U.S. commercial enterprises and U.S. government offices to a building uh, owned by the PLA in Shanghai. <laughs> um, now, when you read that report, if you could say, well, is it possible that the Chinese government didn't know uh, what the PLA was doing? You didn't think of any kind of thing. Whatever. This was a pretty compelling report to me. I found it fairly compelling. I mean, a lot of these things are sort of like a, 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 a raw shock test. You know, you see, it's like an inkblot. You see what, what you want to see. Imagine. But I found it fairly compelling. And whether the Chinese government uh, party state knew before or not, it certainly has had pinpointed to it uh, this great danger uh, uh, to the Sino-U.S. relationship, the danger of hacking. But this is not just about the Sino-U.S. relationship. Um, you know, the, I, I will say the United States has responded, the government has responded officially very cautiously. It hasn't named names. It has said it is preparing uh, uh, it, it, it's strategy now is it, 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 considering this preventive, uh, uh, pre preventive uh, uh, action. Uh, it's certainly developing its uh, capacity to deal with cyber warfare. Um, but it hasn't named names. It's given the Chinese government time, and also through 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 quiet diplomacy, is, is discussing this issue. The Chinese have no interest in uh, letting hacking get out of hand. Because the Chinese themselves are embarked and on the, on, on the edge, on the threshold, of major research innovation themselves. Chinese businesses want to protect their intellectual property rights. So, so, so for China, hacking, not just from foreign competitors, but from domestic Chinese, is a serious problem. And um, I think it will be discussed and treated as a serious problem. So in particular, in the commercial realm. Um, Tibet, human rights, religion. 
So these are issues on which there is, in fact, a philosophical basis for disagreement between the two countries. The United States will continue to express its dissatisfaction with what it sees as Chinese lack of progress on these issues. The uh, recent self-immolations of Tibetans in China and in India uh, are a provocation, uh, and uh, the United States has expressed its, its views on this. Um, I will note that the United States has never recognized an independent Tibet. Um, and it's also important to note that specific tensions in these areas have often been sold in, sold in imaginative ways. Um, a little bit outside this, but if we think of uh, Tong, the Tong issue uh, last year, I think the way that was solved really reflects a, a mature, stable relationship between the U.S. and China. Not a crisis relationship between the U.S. and China. Um, there was one time uh, last year when Secretary of State Clinton uh, suggested that internet censorship in China was, a, was an issue of free commerce, so that it was restricting commercial freedoms in China. Well, that was dropped very quickly. Um, and, and so I, I think we see on these issues there will always be disagreements. There are fundamental cultural differences, philosophical differences, ideological differences, differences of political system. There will always be differences, and those differences will always be voiced. Um, nonetheless, I think that the uh, Sino-U.S. relationship is the most important relationship in the world. I think that leaders of both countries have an interest and have an ability to make this relationship as win-win as possible. And I also think that's in the greater interest of the uh, Asian Pacific region and of the world. Thank you.